Hey, Reggie Young here, and I'm here with Nathan. Nathan, if you could take a quick second to explain a little bit about who you are and how you got started. Yeah, Reggie, thanks for, for having me. So I'm a longtime entrepreneur. I started when I was 20 uh, buying and selling textbooks out of my college dorm room, which led me to the wonderful world of Amazon. Uh, through a lot of trial and error, I, I built a pretty large Amazon dropshipping business working with U.S. manufacturers selling baby products and toys. My partner and I, we sold $25 million from 2008 to about 2016 or so. Oh, I'm sorry. That was, yeah, yeah 2008, 2016 or so. Um, and from there, we had hired a, a lot of virtual assistants to, to run that Amazon business, mostly because college kids were, were pretty unreliable. So we had this good army of, of VAs and we started offering these virtual assistants and freelancers to other e-commerce sellers and business owners. And that became the free up marketplace, a competitor to Upwork and Fiverr. This was fun for us because it was our first B2B business. We got to learn marketing and sales and SEO and all the stuff that goes into running a B2B business. And we scaled that business over four years, got it to eight figures. We were acquired at the end of 2019, which is a whole nother story. Uh, we can get into it if you want. But right now, my partner and I, we're focused on building a portfolio of, of B2B businesses that help other entrepreneurs. We have Outsource School that teaches people our unique hiring process that they can plug into their business. We have two bookkeeping brands, Ecom Balance and Accounts Balance, um, one for e-commerce sellers, one for B2B businesses. And we're working on a, an SEO service uh, right now for, for blog articles and content. So we got our hands in a lot of different stuff, but love just building businesses and, and teams around them. Wow. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Absolute beast of uh, you know some moves from scanning books to try and flip them to everything you have now. It kind of brings me back to when I was in university, and I realized that there was a ton of money in books as well, like scanning them and and trying to flip them. And uh, so it's it's really interesting to see how far you've taken it. And it kind of reminds me, and hopefully a reminder to other people, like um, you don't have to go and just start like a multi million dollar business. You can just get started with something simple, learn from that and kind of scale out. So what, what were the reasons, like what, what brought you into scanning books and what, what was it that, that kind of forced you to kind of scale and reach these newer, more challenging, obviously, businesses to, to start up? Yeah. So like every other college student, I spent a fortune on textbooks my, my freshman year. And at the end of the, the first semester of freshman year, this guy came into our, our dorm room and said, hey, I'll buy your textbooks for you. And he had a scanner and he scanned the books and he was offering me pennies on the dollar. And, and I went to the bookstore and they were offering me pennies on the dollar. And I went to Amazon and I saw, hey, if I sold it to Amazon or one of these online textbook stores, they, they would still make their money, but I would make more than if I sold it to uh, the guy coming in my dorm room or the bookstore. So I sold my books and I started offering this to my other friends. I said, hey, I'll sell your books for you. I, I had a little process for finding the place that would give me the top dollar and I'll take a percentage. You get higher than the bookstore and it was a win for everyone. And then I created a little referral program um, where I would pay affiliate money out and I had people lining up outside my dorms to, to sell me their books. Well, Books was great, but there was some downside. Books are really heavy and they're tough to store and you got to actually package everything. And it wasn't necessarily a scalable business. Plus on top of that, um, it really comes into play at the end of the semester. Like during the semester, people need their books. So they're not trying to, to sell them. And then I also got a cease and desist letter from my college telling me to knock it off and stop competing with their school bookstore and stop running that business on campus. So my parents are both teachers. I didn't want to get kicked out of school. And uh, that was kind of the, the end of that. It, but it led me to, to Amazon. I started experimenting with non-book products. Oh, that's excellent. Would you, would you recommend somebody? I mean, of course, that was a huge opportunity back then. Would you recommend them getting started in that now? Or what would you recommend for you know, someone first starting out in terms of what, what they should be looking at for a business opportunity? I, I think reselling in general just teaches you so much and can lead you to other opportunities. Like my, um, my wife's brother is buys and, and sells different uh, electronic products. And I don't necessarily know exactly how he does it, but he's always looking for deals online and buying them and trying to list them online for, for more. And I mean, it's a great way to just learn entrepreneurship, learn sales, get, get some uh, experience there. But 
you never know where it's going to take you. When I started selling books, I didn't think, hey, I'd be running this gigantic baby baby dropshipping business on Amazon. I just slowly got there and it can lead you in all sorts of directions. So it's a good starting point just because you don't need a lot of money to do it. And it's a good way to, to make some side money and get it started. I wasn't really doing reselling, but I determined within my like spreadsheet budget that I could afford $200 a month. And then with that $200 a month, I was like, well, I can do a Shopify and then high ticket. So that's eventually... Uh, how I got started and um, and then scaling from high ticket to to Amazon and Amazon to other things now as well. Um, I, I really want to now kind of hit on the the free up side of of things because when I I remember seeing free up like early days when I was listing myself on Fiverr to try and get more work and expand my portfolio, my knowledge, my reach. And I remember coming across free up and even trying to integrate, you know, be listed as a freelancer. Uh, I was part of like the Slack groups when you guys were on Slack and 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 seeing how you guys were doing things. At the time, in my opinion, FreeUp was like hold held just a strong brand name as Fiverr. And if, you know, I'm sure, pretty sure most people listen to this podcast know how big Fiverr is. And and for you to to scale that company out, could you talk a little bit about your experience there and how that ac- ac- acquisition went and who you ended up selling to? Yeah, I mean, free up was a lot of fun. I kind of mentioned we we got to learn SEO and partnerships and and going on podcasts and really experimenting on how do we actually drive traffic uh, to our own website and be everywhere. Because with Amazon, we just listed a product and and it would sell. And this is before PPC and a lot of the stuff that that Amazon has now. So, I mean, a lot of it was brand awareness and going on lots of different podcasts, finding let's say Amazon software companies and say, hey. You don't provide VAs. We don't provide software. Let's cross promote each other and get you in front of our audience and and vice versa. Um, getting backlinks on ton of high ranking sites and and getting influencers to promote us. It's all part of our, our organic marketing blueprint that we use on, on all our companies. If anyone wants to go to outsourceschool.com slash organic marketing, um, you can grab our blueprint. It's the same thing we do on all of our businesses, a combination of partnerships, podcasts, influencers, affiliates, backlinks, reviews. Um, and, and we really just consistently do these things. Now, you mentioned like brand, we're we're very customer focused in anything that we do. And, and we also understand business is not perfect, especially early on when you're you're figuring things out. And we did, we had beta testers with, with all our companies, like our bookkeeping brands. We we gave out two free months of bookkeeping with the expectations that we're not going to be perfect. And we want to hear feedback. We want to know what we're doing wrong. And, and we did the same thing with free up. We gave out all these free hours of virtual assistance and we wanted to hear what was going wrong. And in the first year, we were pretty good, but there were situations where the VAs didn't do a good job or a freelancer messed something up and we would just make it right. No questions asked, either get the client credit, get them a replacement, cover replacement costs, whatever it was to, to make sure that not only the clients were happy, but we didn't want the, the freelancers or VAs to feel screwed over either. So we'd come up with creative solutions to try to bridge the gap and make sure everyone is happy. And and that sticks around. I mean, if you hear people that will go to Upwork or Fiverr and they'll have a bad experience and in their mind, they're like, hey, I'm never going to hire from Fiverr again, or I'm never going to hire from Upwork again. And we didn't want that with FreeUp. So even people that didn't have the best experience knew that they were going to get taken care of. We built a lot of trust with those initial clients and and we tried to do that all four years that that we ran the company. And a lot of that just spread our reputation that, hey, you're gonna have a great experience. They they back up their word and and that was a big part of it. In terms yeah. of, of selling it, sorry, I don't know if you have something else. No, 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 yeah, no, please, sale. please. Yeah, no, hit it. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean we didn't go into 2019 saying, hey, we're going to sell this thing by the end of the year. We had a really strong growing business that was really profitable, cash flow positive, uh, great remote team, very lean, didn't have a lot of expenses. And one of our clients reached out to us and said, hey, we, we like free up. We use free up. Uh, we don't start businesses. We buy businesses and we want to get into the freelance VA space. Would you be interested in being acquired? And we had a good initial phone call with them. They ended up making us an offer. And that what proceeded then was the most stressful six months of my life. I mean, we had to decide to sell it, but then we also had to go through due diligence. And we were at we were do, do, doing due diligence on them just like they were doing it on us. We wanted to know everything about them, their net worth, their success, their failures. We didn't want to sell it to someone who was going to argue with us for years or end up in a lawsuit or hurt our reputation or treat our team bad. So 
we wanted to really make sure that that we were selling it to good people. And during those six months, we, my partner and I, were reminding each other every day, hey, this deal can fall through at any second. We got to stay focused on growing this business because if the if it does fall through, we want a good business to go back to. And even after due diligence, once the lawyers got involved, like for for us, it was the biggest moment of our life. For lawyers, it's just another Tuesday. They're doing this stuff all the time. They go on vacations. Their lawyers are trying to protect them. Our lawyers are trying to protect us. So that's back and forth for, for months as well. So incredibly stressful. We were lucky enough to sign on the dotted line. And even then you're, you're kind of crossing your fingers and hoping it all works out. But we couldn't have sold it to better people. They honored their word. They paid us every penny that our team's still with them. Um, free up still running. So it, it all worked out, but it was definitely a, a crazy experience. Hey, yeah, totally. It's, it's beautiful to look back and see your, your old baby still, still churning through. And um, also, like, congrats on you for, like, being able to do both, like, manage that company and also manage an exit. Obviously, extremely stressful times. And I, th- I don't know if, like, anybody can act, can completely prepare for it because it is just a, a whole other workload that, that approaches um, the exit. If you, do you have any, looking back, are there any things you did right or wish you did uh, as it relates to your exit? Yeah. So the best, the best advice I got, because we were seeking advice from different entrepreneurs in the space was to vet the buyers, like I said. So that was key. If you're going to sell your business, make sure you vet your buyers. I would rather take less money, but sell it to better people um, than more money, but sell it to some jerk who, or someone who just doesn't know what they're doing and is going to drive your business into the ground. So that's important. I think for, for us, like I was the, the face of free up, right? I would go on the podcast. People knew who I was, but and I heard for for years that I wouldn't be able to sell free up because I was the face of it. But the key was we had a great team that ran all operations, uh, recruitment, matching VAs, customer service, sales calls. So all of that was very sellable. It was very easy for someone to come in with a, a new marketing strategy um, and change that as long as the operations were being run. And then just having a really good team, having really good standard operating procedures. When they asked us how things worked, we had 50 pages of Google Docs saying, hey, this is the breakdown for how sales calls go, how we handle issues, how billing works every day, how we pay freelancers. So everything just step by step, exactly written down and documented what was a big part in the sale. And just knowing your numbers. I mean, one of the best decisions we ever made after not really knowing what we were doing with bookkeeping on our Amazon business was hiring a bookkeeper from day one of free up. And not only were we able to make really good decisions each month based on what the numbers were, were actually telling us, when we went to sell the company, we had four years of immaculate books going back to day one that that really helped us accelerate it and get good buyers. So that, that those are kind of some keys that, that I learned. Yeah, totally. And if you if you do have any like regrets or things you could have maybe done better or wish you had, had done better on your exit, do you have any of those like thoughts in regards to that? In terms of what? In terms of your exit, so if you like going, if you could go back again and do your exit differently, would you have done anything differently? Or I don't. It really worked out. I mean, could we have maybe yeah. find a buyer that offer us more money? Maybe, but we're super happy with who we sold it for. I think if I could do anything different with free up, I probably would have invested in software early on. We kind of slow played building out our software and had a minimal viable product, but it also is very in line with what we do as a business owner. We always kind of prove the concept before we just pour money in or or spend a lot of time on something. So I don't know. I mean, there, there's plenty of just business decisions along the way that in hindsight, it's 2020 that you would change. But overall, we're super happy with who we sold it for and and how it, how it worked out. And it's allowed Connor and I to just have financial freedom and, and do what we want going forward. And, and it also changes how we start businesses and, and how we're able to, to accelerate a little bit. Yeah, totally. I think, you know, one of my things that I, I wish looking back that I could have done better is, is I had found a contact for my Amazon private label product uh, to try and get uh, a Disney um, license or something like that, because I had basically maxed out my category, all the other search volumes in, in other countries didn't look competitive. And I was always losing 10 to 15% market share to people who didn't have a Disney license, but they were branding a similar product with a Disney license. And I, I started getting really close, finding the leads. Um, and I wish I had pushed a little bit more, but at the end of the day, it's like you look back and you're happy with your exit. And um, so yeah, c- congrats to you on that. Th- the next thing I want to touch, and I, I really loved is like, uh, you know, obviously SOPs, 
having that transferability in place is super critical. But I love that you said like 15 pages of Google documents, because there's all this software now on how to do an SOP and how to do this and that. But I, I just really love, and I resonate in the same way. It's just Google Docs. Everybody knows how to use it. They, you know, like from day one, it's very intuitive, probably with a basic template and an SOP to create SOPs. And you're probably off to the races, moving really quickly. Um, could you speak to a little bit about you know, how, the SOP process and and maybe a little bit more on that that blueprint and how, how that feeds into that overall blueprint that you've been, been able to apply from one business to another? Yeah. If you want to talk about failed businesses, my partner and I tried to build an F SOP software and the software is good. It's just like you said, it's not that much you need when you can put it on Google Docs. So um, for, for us, keeping SOPs, we try to break it down into three parts and we teach this a lot in outsource school. Start with the why. Why are you doing this task? What, what makes this task successful? What's the, the point of it? If there's any background of it, if there's any way that it used to be before that you've made changes to, what are the reasons behind that? So before someone starts any task, what is the actual goal? And then you've got the, the steps, step one, step two, step three, start with a rough draft. You can always add subtasks as you go. Eventually you want your, your VA to have ownership of the SOP so that they, when the task, when they improve something on the task, they update the SOP. And, and that's a big part of, of what we, we preach as well. And lastly is the important reminders. Do not do this for, for any reason. If you yeah. have a VA running your, your, your inbox, if you have five VIP clients, hey, if any of these five clients email me, don't respond to those emails or let me know or, hey, respond. Hey, hey, Bob, thanks for the email. Nate's at lunch right now. He'll respond to you directly when he gets back. So that's just an example, but that's how you want to set up your SOPs. You don't want to assume that people are going to know the, the important reminders or, or the do not do. So the why, the steps, and, and the important reminders is a great way to just framework all your SOPs. And I can definitely triple down and follow up on that. You know, as my my former profession before this was a nuclear missiles officer and if we talk about checklist discipline and at the end, preparing for the end of the world scenario having literally binders and binders of sops and checklists and i can say for sure those principles are definitely required and having those those warnings for sure An another thing that i felt like has helped uh at least my experience as a nuclear missiles officer and of course translates over to businesses putting the i realize when i have my vas make make SOPs, sometimes they put steps in the wrong order. So always putting the warning and the, the major error before before you, they actually put that action step is very important. And then it, also, I feel like communicating to them that, hey, like most things are can be fixed, but some things can't be fixed. And like, for example, one of them I've done for email outreach is always triple check that you spell the person's name correctly. That's uh, a great one. So <laughs> just <laughs> random things <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, if you've had issues with past tires, that's a good thing to to tell the new hire up front and to put in your SOPs. We before we found our great bookkeeper, we had two bookkeepers that we fired. And when we started, we said, "Hey, here's a bunch of things those past bookkeepers did that drove us crazy that we didn't like. That was wrong, and that gives them a really good starting point of of what success versus failure looks like." Mm, yeah, I love that as well. Um, so, really, really quickly, uh, if you could, I, I really love how you've just been able to like enter different industries and completely just just really gets so wide i think i saw a post recently on linkedin you passed like something like 30k followers on linkedin and having that many followers on linkedin is not like having 30k followers on instagram it really is like a magnitude larger in terms of reach and scale um i'm pretty sure that a lot of that comes from the principles of of what you put in outsource school could you maybe speak to a little bit of of those strategies and maybe like you know a, a few a few in-depth tips that can really drive a lot of value uh, for people who may be trying to change their industry. Yeah. So consistency is key. When we started free up every day, I would wake up and I would actually use my VA for this, but I would have three blogs to reach out to, to see if they would either allow a guest post or a backlink, three podcasts to pitch, to try to get on three potential partners to reach out, to see if they wanted to do content swaps, three influencers to reach out to, to see if they were interested in promoting free up or be an affiliate. Um, three potential clients reaching out to some bigger companies, some leads. And, and, and part of that, you have to factor in failure. Like people are going to reject you, ignore you. You're going to have to follow up. But if you're doing that five, six days a week, you are so ahead of every entrepreneur out there that's not doing that. And that consistency is key. 
It's the same thing when we start a company, we say, hey, we're going to publish one high quality blog article every, th every single week. And maybe after six months or a year, we update that to two or three. And it doesn't seem like a lot. And it's not like I launch a blog art article and get a client the next day. But over time, your rankings are going to improve. You're going to move higher up in search volume. So it's kind of that, that same thing of um, just that consistency across the board helps you become everywhere, helps you become well-known in the space. And all these things of the organic marketing blueprint, which I recommend people check out, they, they go with each other. You might find a partner that has a podcast or a partner that has a blog article. You might find a client and they become an affiliate and they promote you to other people. Like all these things kind of interweb with each other. And if you're doing these small things consistently, consistently you're going to look back in a year, two years and be like, man, I connected with a lot of people. I was on a lot of podcasts. Our company link is in a lot of places. And that's what's going to help you uh, grow and exceed. And whenever we get into a new place, whether it's our bookkeeping business or this SEO business that we're working on right now, it's the same thing. We, we kind of enter the space knowing that we're newbies and we don't know everything. And we don't try to be like the guru in the space, but we hopefully take our reputation where it's like, hey, if you work with us, we're going to take really good care of you. We're not going to screw you over. We're going to do what we say we're going to do. We're going to listen to feedback to try to improve the process. And we're going to document the journey along the way for whoever wants to follow us so they can see what decisions are we making? Who are we hiring? What are the ups and downs? And so people can follow us along with the journey and, and learn from it. And I think people really appreciate that. Yeah, solid. I think that's really solid advice. And, and you know, for anyone that maybe thinks that it, that it may not be, or they've heard it before, like I would really put, like go back two minutes and hit replay again, because this is coming from someone who's built serious businesses at scale and every single time i've been seeing free up and i have seen you all over the place for years and you're constantly disrupting new businesses different industries you know from 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 free up to what you're doing now and to what you're going to do later uh very very exciting so definitely take uh, what what nathan's saying here to heart um so that brings me to my last my one of my last questions here right when, as it comes to growth i feel like watching what you've been doing that maybe one of your major growth strategies has been, you know, being on podcasts and being out there is, it's kind of that lead spear. Would you, do you resonate that as like your number one growth strategy? Uh, and if so, can you expand a little bit upon that, how to do that? Yeah, good question. I like to think that we don't have a number one growth strategy. Like a big mm -hmm. reason we were able to sell free up is we had leads and traffic coming to our site, coming in from a lot of different places. And I think that that's way better than an agency that gets all their clients on Facebook ads because if Facebook shuts something down, like you, you got to start all over. So for us, to, it's really that whole organic marketing blueprint. If I like, I'm I'm about to have a kid in, in ten days. I'm not going to go on podcasts for a month, two months. But it's not like all the traffic is going to dry up from our site. Hopefully, um, because my business partner is still putting out good content and we're ranking well on SEO. We have partners that are cross promoting us. We have affiliates promoting us. Like. All the other stuff um, still continues to work, even if one thing changes or, or you take a break for, from one. So to me, we try to have a really solid formation of multiple different ways that we're gaining awareness and leads and traffic so that if one goes down, it's not that big of a deal. But with that said, I do like podcasts. I go on them for a reason. They work. It's a great opportunity to network with people, get in front of thousands of people at once. It's good for backlinks and SEO and all that. And, and we have a course called the Podcast Outreach Formula if anyone's interested um, in getting on. Uh, but it's not the the number one way. Right. That's awesome. I love it. And um, I also like that you've chosen an industry um, that applies to most businesses. So you, it allows you to kind of reach that scale regardless of who you're talking to. Sometimes when you, when you niche down all the way, it doesn't give you that that reach. Uh, if you could, last question here: How does uh, how does ecom balance help you know the average entrepreneur out there, and what what can you offer for for other people? Yeah, so we have two bookkeeping services: ecom balance and accounts balance. Ecom balance is for e-commerce sellers. Accounts balance is for non-e-commerce online businesses. And we only do one thing: monthly books. Charge you on the first books by the fifteenth. Easy to read reports with great customer service around it and. It, the cool thing about it is it's built by entrepreneurs. It's not built by bookkeepers. We have a, a great bookkeeping team, but we focus on how can we make it easier for our clients? Everything from getting a quote to getting integrated to communication and customer service with our team. We're process junkies. We want everything to be as efficient as possible. 
And yes, it'll help you sell your company if you want to, or get funding or get investments or make tax season less stressful. But the real reason to do monthly books is decision making. It helps you look at your numbers and make good decisions based on what the numbers are actually telling you each month. Um, and that's what we focus on. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nathan, for your time, for coming on and imparting some pretty solid knowledge across the board. Uh, best of luck to you, your family, and your new baby on the way. Thanks.